Good evening, everyone. I'm going to give it a, just a couple of minutes maybe to let uh, people begin to get on. Praise God, it's a good day. Uh, this is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. You know, this is God's day and the Lord's working. He's working. He's in charge of the world. He's in charge of the nations of the world. He, um, the, the hand of a king is in the, uh, uh, I mean, the heart of a king is in the hand of the Lord. God controls the governments of this world and uh, he sets up kings and tears them down. So we give him the glory for everything. Everything that's going on, we know God's in control of it. So I'm thankful for that tonight. Um, I've been, uh, well, first, before I get into our Bible study, let me just say this, that our governor, Governor Hutchison in Arkansas, has, uh, he is uh, planning on restructuring uh, things for the restrictions. He's going to remove restrictions May the 4th, uh, is the current plan, um, for churches, uh, Restaurants, uh, they still going to need to maintain uh, proper spacing. And uh, I think beauty salons and barber shops, there's several businesses that the governor has agreed to release some restrictions on. And of course, churches is one of them. So for the First Gospel Church people here in Little Rock, the Sunday after May the 4th, we will... Uh, plan on having a, having service. We'll try to maintain some uh, spacing and, and be careful in what we do, but uh, I, it looks like we're going to be able to come back together, and so I'm thankful for that tonight. Um, and I'm looking forward to it because I certainly miss being with the local church people here. Um, I am in enjoying somewhat this uh, Bible study <clears throat> on Thursday nights, and I'm, I'm probably going to continue it for a while and see how it goes. Uh, if those of you uh, that are listening want me to continue the, the weeknight Bible study, uh, let me know, and uh, we'll see how that goes. I've been talking on Thursday nights about showing uh, somewhat the time frame of, of where we're at in God's plan and uh, in the end of the Gentile world that's coming up on us and uh, showing somewhat of a sequence of what has to transpire yet in Bible prophecy. I've talked a little bit about the coming of the Lord and uh, these things that are yet to come uh, and recap a little bit. Uh, I have uh, I've talked a little bit about the fact that the church, number one, the church must be restored for us to accomplish what God wants us to accomplish in the harvest in uh, the end of the world. Uh, I might just kind of jump into things because, you know, I don't want to be too, too lengthy in time. Uh, if you jump with me to the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation, I'm going to be working tonight some on the book of Revelation and showing, and, and I'm going to try my best not to be boring, and I'm going to try my best to, to make it plain enough that you can at least understand what I say, what I'm saying. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> I'll start off in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation just showing that um, the restored church, this is, this is talking about the, uh, uh, the last prophetical trumpet, the, the, the seventh trumpet is uh, sounding here and its uh, purpose is to harvest the end of this world in that last prophetical hour. Uh, if you go back, if you want to just turn back with me right quick to the 
uh, 11th chapter, in the 15th verse, it tells us that the seventh angel sounded and there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Um, and then it says the four and 20 elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. That Those 24 elders represent the ministry. There were um, uh, the, the, the 24 elders are represented in, in uh, First Chronicles 24. It shows the 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 ministry there. There was 24 courses of the ministry in in the temple, and so this this 24 elders represent the ministry. Uh, they fell on their faces and worshipped God, saying, "We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee great power and, and hast reigned." Uh, and then he said, and the nations were angry. Let me tell you something. When the church is restored, just as the early church, the 12 apostles, uh, harvested that world, it, uh, it brought uh, Isaiah, I mean, Pro, uh, Psalm, Psalms 98 says the sea roared. It's talking about the same time frame of the early church. They did that. That set Rome on edge. It set Judaizers on edge. The whole world was angry. The nations were angry back there because of the judgment that was, and, and the manifestation of God that was taking place through his ministry and his people. The same thing will happen down here. Uh, the nations were angry, verse 18 again. Thy wrath is come in the time of the dead and that they should be judged, that thou should give reward unto thy servants, the prophets and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great and should destroy them that destroy the earth. And judgment's coming in the end of the Gentile world. And it said in the temple of God was opened in heaven and there was seen in the temple, the ark of his testament and there were lightnings and voicings and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail, judgment. So <clears throat> I'm just showing you the seventh angel sounded there and, and back over in the 14th chapter, if you'll notice in the sixth verse, it says, I saw an angel fly in the midst of heaven, having an everlast, the, ev the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people. See, God's going to restore the church down here in the end of this world, and there is a, a, a ministry that has restored the truth fully, and it says they're going to fly. They're going to get up off the terra firma, off the earthly, devilish, sensual elements of this world and get in a heavenly place and fly with the everlasting gospel. That's the gospel we're searching God to have in complete fullness. That is the everlasting. It lasts forever. It's the truth. There's no leaven in it. There's no uh, falsehood in it. And so this restored church and restored ministry will operate to harvest this world in the end of the Gentile world, making up the remainder of God's bride. Uh, it says, saying with a loud voice, now look, there's three things that this restored church ministry is going to preach. First is fear God and give, him, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. Listen, I know it doesn't sound like a great big thing, fear God and give him glory. But I'm telling you, saints, we do not have the fear of God that we yet need. If you could just remember some of the great events 
that God has uh, brought to pass the great revivals in America, the way God sent our forefathers to America to establish a nation, one nation under God. And God put us through things. He put us through World War I, World War II, the Korean War. God put us through things to cause us to know his, our need for him and to see his hand in America surviving whatever came against it because of God's grace and God's blessings upon the nation because he, he called this nation to restore his church in. Not because we're a greater people, not because we're wiser, not because of any other reason than God. He had to have a nation, he had to have a people. And, and God, you and I that are in America are blessed high, highly among all nations because God chose this nation and you and I just happen to be fortunate enough to be citizens of America. Now, those of you in other countries, I see different ones that's got on here that are from other countries. I'm not belittling you or your country. If the very fact that God's dealt with you and caused you to see and be a part of the body of Christ. God's added you to the work that he started here in America. But this work is reaching out to nations abroad. And remember, I read you that in the seventh trumpet that, you know, remember, remember what he said when he said, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and his Christ, and he'll reign forever and ever. So God's adding other nations. It'll take the thousand year millennial reign to accomplish the full work of every nation and God causing the earth to become another garden of Eden and an eternal dwelling place. But right now God is adding, he's adding nations, getting, getting the world ready for the future of what God's going to do. Not only in harvesting, the final Gentile harvest, making up the remainder of his bride, but he is also getting ready for the millennial reign and getting the world ready for that. So hear this message, fear God and give him glory. Some of you people are old enough to remember some of the great revivals, some of the great moves of God from the outpouring of of Pentecost in the uh, beginning of the 19, 20th century, 1901, 1902, 1903, and, and forward. The great experience that fell in 1953 that was prophesied by William Souders at the campground. And many great moves of God that we've had. And you could just preach a, just a simple, a simple, evangelistic message and people would get out of their seats without an altar call and run to the altar. Many fall prostrate on the floor and give their heart to God because they recognized God's glory. They, they felt it, the greatness of his spirit, the conviction of God dealing with them and they feared God. The fear and awe and reverence of God was so real and it's coming back, saints. It's coming back greater than it ever has been. When this restored church begins to preach and you feel and see a full manifestation like the apostle Paul when he said, I came not unto you uh, with a, a man's wisdom, but I came in the demonstration and power of the spirit. People heard and felt that man and the anointing uh, that was there with those apostles back there and they, those people yielded to that. People that were sensitive to God, that had uh, God's, the fear of God had been planted in them and then the witness of God, that's coming back again. And you're gonna see people by the droves come back to God. Um, anyway, the hour is judgment come. Let's, let's read on. Uh, worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and fountains of waters. I want to talk about the rivers and fountains of waters in a little while. 
And they followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. That great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. <clears throat> That's talking about, I hate to be so plain, but you need to hear it. It's talking about Christianity and it's Babylon is, means confusion. And it's talking about all of this conglomeration of confusion in Christianity that has separated and divided God's people. And God is going to have a ministry that's going to judge that system. None of that is God's order. We have to have the order of the early church. Jesus is the head of the church. No organization is, but he's the head. He will choose out men. He will back them up. He will bear witness of them. They will operate in the power and demonstration of the spirit. And people will know that are sensitive to God. They will know that he is real and they will fear and respect and have an all for God in a greater way than they ever have before in the Gentile world since the church fell away. So this verse says, this ministry, their next, their, their next message is going to be Babylon is fallen. God's gonna judge that system of Christianity. He will judge it and he will pour out his wrath upon it right now. When God judges it in the 18th chapter of the book of Revelation, it shows that the light of the candle, the, the sound of the millstone, you know, two women are grinding at the mill, Jesus said. One is taken and the other's left. Most of the religious world Christianity teaches that uh, the, the uh, you know, the church is caught up and it leaves everyone else. But that's really not what's going to happen. God's going to judge the false woman. There's two women grinding at the mill. In other words, there's going to be a true body of Christ, a true people of God in one body, one faith, one spirit, and God is going to uh, anoint the ministry of that restored church and he will judge these other systems and they'll be taken out of the way. They'll be judged. And the only thing, that, you know, what will be left will be the people of God in God's kingdom. Well, uh, so God's gonna judge that system that even though right now they have the sound of a grind, of millstone, they have the light of the candle. Let's talk about the candlestick in the holy place, they, I, I don't think that they've moved into second heaven or the holy place, neither I think that about the body of Christ. But we have a high priest, a mediator, Jesus Christ, our savior. And he operates out of that holy place in a sevenfold light. And he, 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 uh, he gives us that light. He gives us understanding by the spirit of God that he gets, that he has in his dwelling place. And so, uh, but the light of the candle that's out there, they, God through the spirit has gave them some understanding, some, uh, some knowledge. But what he said in the 18th chapter when he judges that system, he said the sound of the millstone the light of the candle, the voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard no more at all in thee. God's going to judge that system and take all of that, re remove all of that from that when he's finished. It's, it's a uh, judgment. This is judgment coming on the end of the world, but it's not bad judgment for the righteous and the just. It's good judgment for them and anyone that responds to the manifestation of God. That's what that manifestation is for, the final harvest. And then the third angel, or the third message, in the ninth verse, it says, and the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead 
or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The, the, the beast, there is, the beast system's already been set up. It's been set up for many, many years now. But the image of the beast, see the beast lost its power and its head has been wounded and it hasn't operated as a, as a dragon power, a head on the beast or the dragon system. But it will be restored in the 13th chapter of the book of Revelation. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to the 13th chapter. And I'm, just, I'm doing a recap right here on some of the things that I've already said, but I want those of you who are listening to, to have some backdrop or platform that you can connect with any new thing that I say that I haven't mentioned yet in these, in these studies. Uh, so in the 13th chapter, in the 11th verse, uh, first, let, let, let me say this, and I've already said it, but it'll, I can do this pretty quick. In the first verse, look at thir Revelation 13, 1. It said, I stood upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and upon the horns, 10 crowns. And upon the heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was likened to a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth is the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, notice in the first verse, John said, I stood in, upon the sand of the sea and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. Now, he goes on to explain a little bit, give a little bit of uh, a clue or identification of, of this beast. Number one, it had seven heads and 10 horns. We know in the body of Christ that these seven heads and 10 horns in this chapter represent the seven dragon or world powers that have existed since the first, which is in Egypt then Assyria, then Babylon, then Medo-Persia, then Greece, and then Rome. Those are six heads that have been operating and have operated as a dragon power. Now, the United States and actually the world has not been under a dragon power since in the early 1500s. So there is not a dragging power in your life and mine that we've ever encountered. But trust me, saints, one, there is a dragon power coming. Uh, and I'm going to read it about, read it to you right here uh, in the 13th chapter. And I'm going to explain a little bit about it. One of the reasons I brought this up was because this what John saw was this beast come up out of the sea. Now, uh, he says in verse two, the beast was likened to a leopard. Now, I won't take time to go back, but you can go back and read the seventh chapter of Daniel. And he declares and talks about these four beasts that came up. Now, Daniel's time was during the time of Babylon, so that's where he starts. He doesn't deal with Egypt or Assyria. That was prior to his time, but he starts out with Babylon. But he actually is now, John's writing at the time of Rome. So he's going backwards and showing the dragon powers or world powers that were prior to the Roman power. Now, let's look. It was likened to a leopard. Daniel 7 shows us that the leopard was Greece. Greece was a world power before Rome. Okay, it also was, had the feet of a bear. You remember uh, the bear was Medo-Persia. And it was two, two, two countries there that ruled the world as a dragon in joined effort. And, uh, uh, and 
Rome, this Roman power is pagan and papal Rome. The foundation of it is somewhat like Medo-Persia. And his mouth as the mouth of a lion, which was Babylon. So he's mentioning here Babylon, uh, 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 Babylon, uh, uh, let's see, Babylon, uh, Greece, and Medo-Persia. He mentions them. And of course, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, the, the uh, let me see here, the mouth of the lion. That's the one I missed. That was Babylon. And so this dragon here that he's talking about that's given great authority is Rome. So it is developed out of the sea. Now the sea represents uh, the world peoples, nations, and tongues. That's in the 17th chapter that the angel describes uh, the sea, what the sea is, explaining it to John. Well, these world powers developed out of the world, out of the sea. But notice now, let's go to the 11th chapter and read about this two-horned beast that's gonna set up the mark, the image and the mark of the beast. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. Now, what I want you to see is this other beast comes up out of the earth, not the sea, like, like when he saw this beast come up out of the sea that developed from from the lion, Babylon, from the bear, uh, Medo-Persia, from, uh, from that to uh, Greece, the leopard. That was all, that all, those dragon powers developed right out of the world and they were evolved one from the other. They all, he, Rome had parts of all of them. They all had parts of one another. But the United States of America, and that's why I think this two-horned beast that had horns like a lamb is the United States of America. Number one, it came up out of the earth. It did not come up out of the sea or the world. And here in the book of Revelations, I think you can follow this prophecy that the earth represents the United States of America. It didn't come out of the world. It came out of religion. See, the earth, the earth is a surface that's out of the sea. It's no longer in the water of the seas of this world, but it is a swell. It comes up. It's a higher place than the seas, which is religion. But America, I believe, would be dominant uh, here because it had two horns like a lamb. Horns in the Bible are power. And this, this beat had seven heads and 10 horns. Those 10 horns right there represent the province, the 10 provinces of Rome of those seven world powers. And, but finally, this, this Roman power, the 10 provinces of Rome are important for the powers and the horns of that day. But here, these two horns, like a lamb, the United States, and I'm open, I'm cons I'll consider what anyone says, but this is my position on it right now. The two powers of America is the church and state that was like a lamb. It was lamb-like. Our forefathers were religious, God-fearing men that, that formed our constitution and the laws of our nation and they specifically wrote a separation between church and state because they had no intentions to interfere with God's working on his church. They left that up to the ministry and for God, but they set forth a government with rules of civil power to uh, maintain peace while the church was being formed. When, when 
our forefathers came to America, they fled the beast system. They fled uh, a religious system that dominated and, and uh, uh, basically put people in slavery, dictated religion. It was forced on people and what they believed was forced. Our forefathers came to America for freedom of religion, freedom, peace, and their, their vision was to have a nation, one nation under God, God-fearing men. What, you, what we didn't realize many years ago is, is that democracy is a short-lived government. Democracy has too many loopholes in it, but I, I feel certain that God put it in the hearts of our forefathers he even put it, I believe, in these organizations that formed in the in the Reformation. Uh, you know, they formed governments where the church people were able to control and vote in and vote out pastors and have control. I believe God allowed that. In fact, I think God was the one that, the source from that to give protection to the people because they were, so uh, devastated and became victims of religion. I, I'm not talking about Christianity. Uh, if you remember in the red horse, the early church was a white horse in the first seal. The second seal was a red horse, which is a picture of sin. And the rider of that horse had a sword and he, was, he had power to hurt men. And that represents a Pentecostal era that men had knowledge of the Word of God, but they didn't have all the they didn't have enough truth to maintain wisdom, and therefore they 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 did some damage. Some people became victims of the system. Uh, God knew that would happen, and and it had to happen. There, you know, when God's working with people until God gets us in a place like he had the early church in, like he had Jesus in, we're, we're going we're gonna to have a lot of error, and God has to be long-suffering. That's what the Bible talks about when it talks about him being so long-suffering and patient. God's been patient. He was patient with the early church. James said that, that he had long patience and long-suffering for the precious fruit of the early and latter rain. And so God, we're serving a precious God that has a lot of patience. He certainly has had a lot for me. How about you? God has been so merciful to me that I'm undeserving of his grace, but thank God that he's got that much love and mercy that he could include me and keep working with me. And I'm so thankful for that today. Uh, anyway, so I'm showing you that the that the had, the United States had two horns like a lamb, a civil or, or a civil power and a religious power, two horns, lamb like, didn't have any intent of doing anything wrong, but following God in the beginning, our forefathers had that in their hearts. But as I said, democracy is is a short-lived government because there's too many loopholes in it. And now, you know, for us to have freedom for everyone, we've got to give everyone freedom, which we, our nation has, you know, has turned away from God in so many ways. But thank God there's still God's people working here. They're, they're just like they was in the end of the Jewish world. They're minority. That's what the Bible's talking about when it talks about rivers, and fountains of waters. Uh, Jesus said, when he spoke of the Holy Ghost that had not yet been given, he said, out of your bellies shall flow rivers of waters. That, wa that word fountain means wells springing up within yourself. The, the life of God, the spirit of God that's working in our souls. There's people all over this nation and throughout many parts of the world and in many denominational religious areas that have that 
flowing river in their soul and a well springing up because of the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God that's working in their lives. And so, but if you notice, this other beast came up out of the earth and had two horns like a lamb and he spake as a dragon. Now, let's go back just a little bit here. I'm gonna deal a little bit with the earth, okay? So let's turn to the seventh chapter of the book of Revelations. And if some of you brothers are listening to me and I'm, I'm uh, you know, maybe not following the same path that you've heard on some of these scriptures or maybe you've never heard some of this, just put it on the shelf if you can't agree with it. Uh, don't throw it away. We're still working on it. And, uh, but the people of God need to have some understanding. You can work from, if somebody can give you an understanding, if you could take a person, I've used this scenario many times, but if you could take a man that was used to, and when I was a young man, we had what you called shade tree mechanics on cars. Not, a lot of people were not just great mechanics or well-learned and knew everything about everything in an engine of a car or different parts on a car, but they knew enough. Now today, forget it. It's everything operated by computers on cars. You can't even get to a spark plug, hardly to change it yourself. Back in those days when I was a boy, we, we did most of the work on our cars. We could rebuild carburetors. We could change the spark plugs. We could change out... You know, we could do, we could remove a short block. We could remove the heads and take them and have them ground and change out a busted piston ring or whatever. I mean, it wasn't that hard to do. You could crawl up inside of uh, the hood of a car and go to work on a car. But today you can forget that. But, but my point is in using this scenario, even while we're restoring the word of God, we may not know every single thing and have every truth restored, but if we can take what we do know and build on it, and that's why I feel you saints need to know the position of ministers and what they do know so that you have some platform to work from. You Anything that's wrong, if you thought that a, you know, if you thought that a, a, uh, a spark plug was a resistor or, uh, you know, you could get corrected on that. But at least you heard what it, you heard there was one. <laughs> you, you found out there was a part. I'm just showing you that if you get some understand or, or knowledge, it can turn into understanding. You may have to work on it. The man of God will have to work on it. So I'm listening. I listened to a minister last night in this body talk on a subject that I didn't agree with him on. But I'm, I've been looking at and thinking about what he had to say, and I'm considering that, at least in application, that it can apply down here. Uh, I, I'm, I, I, I want to have a mind to consider and an openness that I can listen to the Word of God and the men of God, especially in areas that these men... Uh, this area I'm working in, it's something I did not... This is not something that I just you know, delve into, but it's something God's dealt with me about for years. And I, I just get a little here and there over many, many years. For 30 years, God's gave me things on the book of Revelation. I woke up in the middle of the night, my mind going up, get up and stay up for hours and maybe just get a little nugget, something that I really felt like God gave me. I want to give those things out and uh, we'll, we'll continue working on. Okay, go back to Revelations, the seventh chapter. Um, let me say something to you. Uh, you may not be able to retain what I'm fixing to say because I'm gonna say it pretty fast, but I wanna explain at least a little bit about the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. I want, to, I want to give you some an understanding about it. There's been all kinds of things taught about that. 
down through the years. And to be honest with you, even in the body of Christ, we've had somewhat of a pig trail through the book of Revelation where we had certain parts that God's gave us, like the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, the, the, the seals, especially the horses, uh, the 11th chapter, the church falling away, the 12th chapter, the woman standing on uh, the moon clothed in the sun, crown of star, 12 stars around her head being the early church, what took place there. We, there's certain parts of it we've had an understanding from. Our forefathers gave to us. But as far as understanding it in context, chapter and verse, we've lacked many things. But God is giving more and more on it all the time. So let me, let me give you this. Just You might want to write it down if you're a student of this. The seven seals. I'm gonna, uh, I want you to know this. The seven seals are, the first six are synoptic pieces of information. Like for an example, the first seal, John saw a white horse and the one that sat on it was going forth, conquering him to conquer with a bow in his hand. That's it. That's the first seal. That's the piece of information and what you have to digest out of that in time with other scriptures helping you understand it is talking about the church, white, is color of righteousness. And the rider on the horse was Jesus Christ, and he went forth conquering and conquering that early church. But the church, it began to change colors. So you got pieces of information in every seal, but only pieces of information. Each seal gave a different piece of information. In the first six seals, now the seventh seal, when the seventh seal opens in the eighth chapter of the book of Revelation, it doesn't close until the end of the book. The seventh seal is in detail. Everything that is and is not covered in the first six seals. But it has a lot of detail to it. Now that is the seven seals. Now the seven trumpets starts in the eighth chapter. When the, eighth, when the seventh seal opens, he, he, he sees there was seven trumpets. And the seven trumpets starts off back there with Jesus Christ in that early church and his ministry, the second seal. And the third seal, the church, be, uh, you know, uh, in fact, there where I told you about waters and, and fountains, if you want to look with me in the eighth chapter, and I don't want to get off my subject here too much, but I think this is important. Uh, the third angel sounded in the third trumpet. Uh, the, uh, uh, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp, and it fell upon a third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star was called Wormwood, and the third part of the waters became Wormwood. Many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. This is talking about the falling away of the church. That star that fell was the ministry back there. After the apostles went off of the scene, and you know Jesus told the men at Ephesus, after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in, uh, not sparing the flock, men of your own selves, he said. I told you this, he said, even weeping. He, he saw and knew that the church was going to fall away. Uh, I, I'll explain that later uh, why, but uh, I'm just showing you on the, this, when this star fell, wormwood uh, was what it was called, and and it fell upon a a third part of the rivers and upon fountains of waters. In other words, the people of God that had the life of God working in their soul and working upon them, this falsehood of a fallen ministry began to work and it began to make the, the waters or the spirit of God bitter and a third part of those men died. Now, when it says the third part, let me explain to you the third part. 
There's three times, there's three times in God's working that there is eternal judgment. In the early church from the day of Pentecost or from, from Jesus, his life himself, but for man outside of Jesus, it was from the day of Pentecost until God harvested that world and, and cut, AD, cut Jerusalem off in AD 70 or Israel. That was just one third of the three judgments of God. It judged everyone, not just a third of those men back there. But if one part was judged back there under eternal judgment, when the church is restored down here, another part, that's another third, will be judged. All, everyone in rivers and fountains of water will be judged down here if they do not heed to God, if they are, uh, if they turn against God and God's manifestation, God will judge. He, he will get, show them a full manifestation first, but if they don't heed to it, God will judge them. They will be eternally judged before it's over with. And then the other third is down through the thousand years, including the great white throne judgment after the thousand years. So there's the three thirds. There, each one is a third, but it judges everything in each world, in the end of each world. That's a third part. Okay, so um, I'm, I've just told you this, the seven, okay, and the seven trumpets, they start with Jesus, the second trumpet, you know, they take a, a great mountain, that's the apostles, uh, burning with fire and cast in the sea. Ju they judge the religious world of Judaism and the secular parts, you know, Her uh, uh, Herodianism, uh, Essians, Greek, Grecians. Though that religious world back there was judged. That mountain of religious was cast into the sea into the world and showed that it was a false religious system. The only thing that was true was the body of Jesus Christ and God called everyone into it that could be harvested and brought into it to make up a portion of his bride in the end of that world. Okay, that's the seals, the trumpets. They they don't necessarily go together. See the first, see the first, the first seal was a white horse. That is the, also, Jesus was the trumpet blower of the first, because it, it a third part of the trees. See, Jesus judged the flesh, the trees and all green grass was burned. See, that in that world, Jesus judged the flesh. He set forth a judgment in his own life that can, that mortified the deeds of the flesh and left an example for that early church and they followed his example and overcame and reached perfection or maturity in the nature of the Holy Ghost of that inner man that they were born of by the Spirit of God. But the second, see the second trumpet was also in the first seal. The second trumpet was part of the creatures that was in the sea, um, uh, that's that great mountain. Those were the apostles in that white horse of the early church that judged that mountain of religion. The third angel that fell, that is, that's the red horse. When, when, the, the, when the men of God begin to in uh, incorporate into their hearts and their thinking falsehoods. And they begin to change the truth of the word of God. The church began to fall and sin began to enter in the red horse. So that was the second seal that started there. And then in the fourth seal, AD 70 came and uh, darkness came in that world after AD 70 or when AD 70 took place. Then the fifth seal was talking about Mohammedism. That was a woe that came on the Catholic church that 
<coughs> caused them to begin to see uh, they began to they began to distract the Catholic Church and allowed the Reformation to begin. So uh, then the sixth seal that is that has to do with the Reformation, and then of course the seventh seal is the last prophetical hour. I was telling you. Now the 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 seven vials are not going to take place until the end of the Gentile world. That's the judgment on the end of the Gentile world that ends in Armageddon. So, so these, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven plagues, they don't necessarily go together, but they have to do with each other. The seventh, the seventh trumpet, definitely the seven vials are, are poured out in the seventh trump and the seventh seal, I'm sorry, the seven trumpets. Sorry about that. And the seventh seal. The seventh seal uh, starts, is opened in the eighth chapter and it stays open till the end of the book in, in Revelations 23. So that's just that. Now let, let me go to Revelation 7, the seventh chapter and I'm gonna try to take you back. I hope I haven't confused you too much by giving out too much, but this is gonna be, it is recorded Though it's live, it's recorded on, on our webpage, which is, it's, it's included in the description of this broadcast. And Brother Painter not only has put it on our website, but I believe he's put it on YouTube also. So you can go back and listen to it again. You can take notes. You can try to get it in your mind more. Feel free to email me if you want to. If you've got questions, I'd be glad to try my best to help you in any way that I can. Uh, mainly, I'm talking to our saints, those of you who are listening that are, you know, not part of our church. Well, um, I don't want to be very controversial. And what I will tell you is listen to your pastor. You can consider maybe what I say, but you listen to your pastor because I'm not trying to confuse anything he tells you that would be anything different. So, uh, you know, but but I I do have saints in the Dominican Republic and different places and different countries and, and places in America, and I I, I do want to help them. Um, so if you'll go with me to the seventh chapter, I have talked and explained to you about the Earth being the United States of America of the two horned beast that rose up out of the Earth, not out of the sea. The difference that was there. Now in the seventh chapter, I'm going to deal a little bit with the earth again. The seventh chapter is dealing with, it is the sixth seal. This is in the sixth seal. And, and he's dealing with the end of the Gentile world. And he said, after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Notice the winds are not to blow on the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Let's read a little further. And I saw another angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to the earth, uh, to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Well, here he's, at, he's, he's saying that these four winds, we've always taught these winds are civil powers, religious powers, civil and military powers. There's two, civil and military. Then religious powers. The, the, those, um, uh, uh, those powers, uh, those winds are blowing. Religious doctrine is blowing. Uh, it's, it's blowing today. Uh, it's hard to even tell some of the teachings that's been in the past by certain uh, denominations because they, 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 they change some and winds are beginning to blow and change. Uh, uh, and so 
these wins, military, civil powers, military and civil powers, uh, financial is the other power that's, these winds are blowing. Look at what's happening to our economy right now because of this pandemic. You don't think God's in control of this? I'll promise you he's in control. He knows exactly what he's doing and it will bring a change. It's gonna bring a change. I think there will be good come out of it, but a lot of people don't take into consideration what God's doing and what God is gonna to do to bring, bring about his plan. See, we're not just going along just doing what we want to do. God's in control. He's the creator. He has a, a eternal purpose. That's what he's working on. He's not concerned about the temporal things of this world that man who do not regard him, he's just going to fit that into his plan. We've said in the body of Christ for many times that you're either going to work with God or you're going to work for him. God is going to use everything to see to it that his purpose, his eternal purpose is accomplished. And so I, I, my desire is to learn how to work with him. I don't want to work for God. Not, not that God has to use me. I mean, I want him to use me for his purpose. And I want to be working with him and him using me for that purpose. But I don't want to be, I don't want God to use me like he would use, you know, a king or a nation or, or a, a facet in this world. And some of it God don't care about. It's just flesh. It's just going to go by the wayside. He's not concerned about everything, every, every little thing. He's concerned about his people his purpose, his eternal purpose. And so, uh, but here God is saying, don't you hurt the earth. He is not gonna allow the United States to be hurt. The religious element that he set up to restore his church, he's not gonna allow the United States to be hurt until it accomplishes restoring his church. And neither the sea, the sea's humanity, but there are many people of God that have been victimized. They've been hurt, or maybe they just gave up. Some of them starved to death. They never had enough spiritual food to make it on. They gave up. They know God's real, but they, they just gave up. They just didn't have enough of God to, to make it. They may have been born of the Holy Ghost. They may have been... Uh, had a great experience with God, but they didn't have enough food to keep their inner man sufficiently alive. And they starved. Many of them went back in the world. They gave up on it. God knew that was going to happen. He, he understands the situation of, of what it takes to restore a church and deal with the people to get them to a place that they can be in a, a finished product. And it's going to take a church like the New Testament church to finish that end of our world. So, God's working. And he's not going to let America go down. It will. America's going to get judged. It's going to go down. But it's not going to go down. And it, it'll have to go down for the ten kings to take control. See, there's 10 kings going to come into existence that are, are going to take over when America goes down, and America will have to be in, go down in judgment for that to happen. But, so he says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea. Don't you hurt the sea. Don't the winds destroy the people that have just a measure of life. They're my children, but they're, they're you know, my children, but they're lost. But I haven't forgotten. And he will. Those people that had the river and fountains of waters working in their life. Not only those that's out in the world. I found a few rivers there. near you. The no. first one is Brewer Branch. <laughs> the second one is Landmark Branch. The third one is Treadway Branch. 
that is my TV and I'm sorry, I'm safe, but I don't know how to fix it. It's off. But Google hears me on my TV and when I said, when I talk about the rivers, it said, well, I found, the Google said, I found these three rivers near you, dear Lord. I don't know how to fix all technology of today. Anyway, it's somewhat comical. Anyway, God is not going to allow those people that are out in the world to be, they're not going to be hurt to a way that he can't reach them until he seals his servants in their foreheads, until the church is restored is what's going to accomplish that. And in that restoration, God's going to call his people out of the world, out of the sea. His full manifestation is going to reach all of God's people that can be reached. It won't reach them all. They won't all respond. But everyone that who will, whosoever will, drink of the water of life freely, let him come. God's going to open the doors and God is going to cause people to see his manifestation and feel his spirit and an operation of God that the world knows that he is real. And they're going to feel him in a way that they can respond to him. It'll be strong enough that for them to reject it would be blaspheming. They'd blaspheme the very full operation of God that just like the early church saw. If you rejected that, there wasn't any hope for you. Anyway, don't hurt the trees. Trees here are righteous people. They'll be called trees, trees of righteousness, Isaiah said. We, we're all, you know, every tree, John the Baptist said, that brings forth not fruit will be hewn down. That's talking about God's people that are alive. They're alive trees. And so I just was giving you that on, on uh, uh, on the earth. Now, I'm not going to go through it because we're running out of time, but if you'll turn with me to the 16th chapter, I'll just introduce the seven vials, and I'll work on them next Thursday night. We're at least going to have one more, maybe two more Thursday nights before we have service again. Thank God uh, it's going to be open back. Restrictions are going to be open back up in Arkansas where we can have service. If you can't have service in your state, well, when will that be? The 4th is a Monday. The 3rd, the 10th of May, we're going to have service at, at, at First Gospel Church in Little Rock. You're all welcome. <laughs> Praise God. I'm looking forward to that. I'm missing the saints and I'm missing church. The first chapter, uh, or the 16th chapter of the book of, uh, yeah, Sister Heidi said, I see men as trees walking. Yeah, Jesus prayed for a man and he saw men as trees. Those are right. That's the righteous people of God. All right, verse three. Uh, no, let's go back to uh, Revelation 16, one. It says, and I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Mm. I'm sorry, but that's America. God's going to pour his wrath out on this nation because this nation's turned their back on God. And the Bible says when a nation turns its back on God, God will judge that nation. God, this nation has been blessed above every nation in the world. And God will judge it. Uh, so he's going to pour out the vials of wrath on the earth. Uh, the first went and poured out his vial upon the earth and there fell a noisome, grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast and upon them which worshiped his image. So what's gonna be poured out in America is gonna be on those that worship the mark of the beast and that worship his image because that's going to take over a great part of God's people, even in America. And uh, it, he said he would pour it out a uh, noisome and grievous sore. That's, a, that's like a calamity uh, that is going to punish people. 
for turning their backs on God. And then the second angel poured out his vial on the sea. See, I've been talking to you about the sea. God's going to give an opportunity first for all of his people to come up out of the world that's been victimized, that's out in the world not serving God, that starved to death maybe spiritually, that's went out in the world. Those people are, are going to, they're going to see and, and feel a full manifestation of God. God's going to reach out to them. But if they don't hearken to God, then he will pour out his vial upon the sea and it'll become blood of dead men and every living soul died in the sea. There won't be a child of God that's not judged eternally during that time that's in the sea. Then a third angel poured out his vial upon the rivers and fountains of waters and they became blood. I told you that those fountains and living, living water, that's the people of God. And if you'll read um, a little further there, it said, and I heard the angel of the water say, thou art righteous, O Lord, which art and was and shall be because thou hast judged us for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and thou hast given to them blood to drink, and they are worthy. And I heard another uh, out of the altar say, even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are thy judgments. I won't finish the vows, but we'll work on this maybe a little bit more next week. Some of you may be getting tired, uh, uh, you know, of, I don't know if, you, if you're if you interested in this kind of teaching. I wish you'd let me know. If you are, we'll, we'll, we may, we'll keep it up for a little while, but I can just talk about the love of God. And I can even evangelize a little bit, but this is one of the things that I feel like the saints of God need to know something about the future and what's coming and what has to transpire before the end. So it's not fixing to be over saints. We've got a lot that's got to transpire, a lot of prophecy to be fulfilled. But you and I should serve God to the best of our ability diligently and be soldiers. Listen, go to the ant, thou sluggard. <laughs> the little ant, you know what they do? They're always preparing for the winter. They're always gathering, taking down into those little uh, mole hills that they make down into the earth and the little tunnels and they're, they're gathering food for the winter. They're gathering for the future. Go to the end. Thou sluggard, it says. I don't want to be a sluggard. I want to be like the ant. I want to gather for the future. I want to understand. God bless your hearts. Once again, if you got in late, I told the people in our church, the governor has said he would release restrictions on May the 4th, and that means May the 10th. Sunday, we will have church, the First Gospel Church. God bless your hearts. I love all of you. Remember to pray for the needs that we have. Pray for the Dominican Republic and the other missionary works in um, Honduras, uh, the Philippines, Mexico, uh, uh Africa, Nigeria, all of these places God's working in. Haiti, of course. Uh, God bless you, Brother brother Carpio. I see you're on with us, Brother Faustin. Uh, God bless you all for, for tuning in and listening to us. But remember these needs of these other countries. There's a lot of people in the Dominican Republic. They, they have a curfew. They have to be in by five o'clock in the evening. Nobody's working. People are starving. I sent uh, uh, the best offerings I could send out to the pastors today. Uh, thank you, uh, all of you that has mailed us some missionary offering. I promise you it's doing a lot. It's doing, we're buying rice and beans and that's all they can do is, is all they can eat. They're, they're hungry over there and no one's working. It's, it's, it's necessary that, that we try to help our brothers. If, when you see one of them in need and you shut up your bowels of mercy, God is not pleased with that. We, we have to be thoughtful of our brothers. Pray for those in our church that are sick. <clears throat> Pray for Sister Rhonda Oates, Brother 
Brother Oates passed away in Godfrey this past week, a couple of days ago, and we're praying for Sister Oates, remember her, and uh, that God will help her and comfort her in that assembly there under Brother Dave's. Remember Brother Gary Wright, uh, he's somewhat encouraged. He's walking on a walker now some, and, and he seems to be doing better. And we're praying and asking God to help him. If you was in the condition that he is in, wouldn't you want the people of God to pray for you? Sure you would. Let's pray for our brother, Brother Gary Wright. Uh, sister, uh, is it Bella? Brother Brother Veeley's, Gary Veeley's granddaughter that has cancer, keep her in your prayers. Remember the saints in our church. Uh, Sister Abraham, Ray and Susan Weaver, Brother Shelby Weaver, uh, Brother Bill Daniels. He certainly is worthy of our prayers. A very faithful brother also. Remember him. Sister Alexander, Sister Wilson, Sister uh, Crafton has health conditions. Sister Weiniger. Uh, I don't think she's enduring anything real serious right now, but uh, then who did I hear today that may have been in the hospital? I got something to notice today. I'm trying to think of who it was. Anyway, remember our needs. God bless your hearts. I love you all. I'm praying for you, and I'm looking forward to that service on May the 10th. Let's pray that that comes to pass. God, God bless you. Pray for me and I'll pray for you. Have a good evening. Good night.